Hello, my friends. This is Deepak. So, continuing our journey into exploring the nature of reality, I have uh, some very interesting insights to share with you today. So, I hope this longer version is working for you. So, first of all, this article in New Scientist. It says, is consciousness fundamental to the cosmos? Rethinking the relationship between mind and matter. And then I want to share with you why this, this doesn't go far enough. This does. But let's start, okay? So right now, uh, you know, as you know, there is something called the hard problem of consciousness, right? And the hard problem of consciousness is um, a problem because um, there is no way, no way uh, to account for experience by looking at molecules and atoms and force fields. Um, so this is... Um, an issue that is probably the most important issue in science right now, because without consciousness, we cannot do science. So let me read a few things uh, <clears throat> uh, from this article before I go on to explicate some insights, explicate, uh, explain, or share. Modern neuroscience has left little room inside the brain for an immaterial soul. Instead, physicalism reigns the idea that everything in nature must be derived from the basic stuff of physics. Of course, physics is a model of reality in human consciousness, so and never mind that uh, the article doesn't say that. It follows that consciousness must, must somehow emerge out of particles, strings, information, or whatever you take as fundamental. It doesn't say, of course, that particles are first experienced before they are described as particles. And as experience, they are space-time events in our consciousness. Strings. Strings is a human concept in consciousness. Information is the resolution of uncertainty in consciousness. So none of them can be fundamental. And yet um, that's what uh, this article suggests that they could be. But while neuroscience can explain with growing precision what kinds of brain activity mat map out conscious states, it's far from understanding why this brain activity gives rise to conscious experience. So what is brain activity? It's also an experience in consciousness. It's a combination of qualia and consciousness. Uh, and the brain itself is an experience in consciousness or awareness. The brain is not an experience in the brain. Then as it goes on, we get into quantum mechanics. It says um, the view from nowhere. And then there is time. Here, physics is once again at odds with our experience in that general relativity's view from nowhere holds that observers, including us, are just coordinates or points in a static chunk of space-time called the block universe, a perfect, unchanging mathematical object in which past, present, and future all exist uh, at once. If this is true, our experience of flowing time from the past to the present and to the future is merely an illusion. So the view from nowhere says that actually um, nowhere is non-local. And the block universe contains past, present, and future all at the same time that um, actually the flow of time might be an illusion. Here, I'm beginning to um, agree. The problem, though, is that a view from nowhere is not something anyone's ever had. Well, let me address that in a moment. All views are from nowhere, including the view of your body and the view of your mind and the view of the universe, which all go together. Um, so um, 
again, he says, the problem is that a view from nowhere is not something anyone's ever had, says Adam Frank at the University of Rochester in New York. We presume that there is some shared objective reality out there. How can be the objective reality be shared other than an experience? I don't get these sentences. But we can never know for sure what quantum mechanics and what questions about time have both pressed on us is the absolute need to understand the observer and to recognize it as a physical constituent of the world. This is amazing. The observer is, uh, cannot be physical because the observer has no form and therefore uh, being borderless, it has no location and therefore it cannot uh, be um, um, considered um, physical or a physical constituent of the world, uh, even though that is suggested by Ismail, Gian Ismail, a philosopher at Columbia University in New York. For centuries, we could ignore observers with little consequence. She says, not anymore. So she herself is part of the observed. The observer is an experience is not an experience. The observer is experiencing her, the one who's making that opinion, and including the opinion is a space-time event in consciousness. And it goes on and on. But most physicists aren't buying that extending the fundamental stuff of physics to include micro-consciousness would disrupt our remarkably successful account of how the universe works says Sean Carroll, the California Institute of Technology at Pasadena. We have little idea of what consciousness is. Well, consciousness is that which is presenting this conundrum through the body-mind of, of Sean Carroll. Um, then Sean Carroll um, goes on to say, so adding um, it directly into such precise and definitive equations could knock everything else of kilter. Well, where are the equations created if not in consciousness? And so continuing to quote um, uh, Sean Carroll, to start with the least well understood aspects of reality and draw sweeping conclusions about the best understood aspects is arguably the tail wagging the dog. Uh, Carroll wrote in a recent issue of the Journal of Consciousness Studies. So it's the other way around, you know, that the, the, to uh, try to explain consciousness on the basis of concepts such as space, time, energy, information, matter, uh, in uh, is is the tail wagging uh, the head. It's the other way around. So then he quotes another philosopher, Goff counters that the only way to make sense of our subjective experiences or qualia, such as the redness of a sunset or the sharpness of a lemon, is to treat them as new data that science must include. This new approach complements rather than contradicts physics. So now we're getting there, okay? The qualia could be fundamental. And um, it goes on now quoting Goff. Um, who and others, Eleanor Knox, philosopher at King's College London. Um, but the basic conclusion here is we may want to consider a new cosmology which is rooted not in objects but events. Now we're getting there. What we call objects are space time events in consciousness and modified forms of consciousness. Um, and then it goes on to talk about qualia. Overall, extremely well written, but leaves me unsatisfied. And the reason it leaves me unsatisfied is that it doesn't actually um, get rid of the idea that matter is not real. Matter is a human interpretation in human consciousness for a combination of modalities of experience and knowing, which in themselves are qualia. 
Qualia are basically space-time events in consciousness. They are qualities of experience. And so everything that you experience, including a brain, is a combination of qualities of experience. They are a combination of qualia, given that label. Brain, matter, body, Milky Way galaxy, particles, they themselves, even neural correlates are experiences in consciousness and they're subjective experiences in consciousness. Who or what is it that knows qualia, okay? Including the qualia that create the experience of the brain. How do you know there's a brain? Through qualities of awareness, such as color, shape, form, texture, taste, smell, hardness, softness, the qualities of awareness. The brain and every other object is a quality of awareness. So, you know, the questions come up, does AI, for example, um, will it ever become conscious? In here, we are assuming that AI and computers and everything else are known not as a combination of qualities of experience, but exist independently of our awareness of them. So that in itself is, 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 uh, is a wrong presumption. What I'm suggesting, my dear friends, is that gravity, the curvature of space-time, even as a concept, and um, energy and information and force fields, are all actually combinations of qualia. There's nothing other than qualia, which means qualities of experience. And qualities of experience are modifications of that which gives rise to experience, which is awareness. So there is nothing other than awareness. You and the universe are awareness, but the experience of objects, including the universe or this book or anything else, the paintings behind me, is a combination of modalities of experience that we can only call qualia. Okay, so uh, actually the reason I'm getting there slowly is this book, You Are the Universe, which was written with co-author Menas Kafartos, who's a, a cosmologist and a quantum physicist, who trained in MIT, uh, we got towards the end of the book to the point where we said uh, that qualia are fundamental and they're fundamental aspects of, of uh, experience. And without experience, there's no description of the universe, including the fact that the description itself is communicated through qualia, through these sounds or these wiggles or these equations which you see and you imagine and those all experiences in consciousness so the qualia are modifications of you which is pure awareness i think the reason scientists are so uncomfortable with these ideas is that uh, somehow this uh, introduces the concept of what um, others have called God or pure consciousness or infinite awareness as fundamental without cause, irreducible, spaceless, timeless. Even space-time as concepts, but as an experience, space-time and the whole theater of space-time and causality is... Uh, a projection of consciousness, modified form consciousness. So space-time are also combinations of qualia. There's nothing that you can experience which is not a combination of qualia. So I'll read a little bit from here now. Um, you are the universe. Uh, and then if you want, we can actually go deeper into the nature of qualia because to be a cosmic alchemist, which we already are, except we are constantly recycling the same qualia combinations with their, um, their um, interpretations as a result of conditioned concepts that have been recycled forever, but can evolve. 
but knowing this allows to you to understand that not only are you a um, what do you call a cosmic alchemist, but you can become a shapeshifter and shift qualia experiences and construct multiple um, forms of yourself and the universe. I know this sounds totally outrageous, but we can explore it if you want. And there will be equations for this too one day. The equations are also combinations of qualia. So let me give an introduction and then we can actually go deeper into the nature of qualia combinations for cosmic alchemy, if you want. Not only cosmic alchemy, but even quantum mechanics, by the way. Those little particles, those virtual particles, those muons, and anything you can name, label, imagine, conceptualize is a quality of experience, qualia. So let me introduce uh, you to the idea of getting comfortable with qualia. For many of you, the term qualia will be new and perhaps alien. Uh, we have placed so much importance on this word that we want you to be comfortable with it. We meaning me and Menas Kafatos. One difficulty is that qualia are all inclusive. Every experience is made of qualia or qualities in consciousness. On a nice summer day, it's not hard to accept the qualia delivered by the five senses. The warm air, bright sunlight, the smell of newly mown grass, and so on. It's harder to believe that your body is also experienced as qualia. All the sensations you're having at this very minute would have no reality unless you experience them personally, and therefore the body is a bundle of qualia. Going a little deeper, the brain's experiences are also qualia. When a concept becomes this universal, it's hard to know what to do with it. What are the rules and boundaries? Or do we live in a reality made of qualia soup? And what about the experience of an external reality, a world out there? This is also a qualia experience. There are no rules to qualia that have the same status as the natural laws. Natural laws are, by the way, regularities of experience, therefore also qualia. So uh, there are no rules to qualia that have the same status as the natural laws that classical physics laid down and the quantum physics took on to an unimaginable level of sophistication. A ripe, sweet peach floods the senses with experience, not numbers, and even the numbers, equations and principles are qualia experiences. However, one can't use the same vocabulary as in the domain of physicalists. Sweet isn't heavier, lighter, bigger, smaller, or denser than ripe or warm. The great advantage of qualia science, and this is what we want to create, uh, if that's the direction that I hope science will take in the future, is um, how perfectly it matches reality. Tasting a peach is a direct experience needing no conceptual framework. The very absence of abstract concepts greatly irritates many abstract mainstream scientists, but it's the seed for a new view of nature, transforming the physical universe into a consciousness-based universe. To give you a compact vision of how qualia science might develop in the future, I will share with you, not right now, but in a future, um, in a future uh, video, uh, a brief set of principles uh, which have been distilled as the basis of a qualia science and a qualia vocabulary. So be a cosmic alchemist, understand qualia mechanics beyond quantum mechanics and then reality will shift totally and completely okay <clears throat>